Okay, hello everyone who's here. Uh, Professor Allen Lee really set the table very well. There was a number of things that he spoke about that I'll be speaking about in greater detail. Uh, now, how many people are familiar with this photo? No. No one. Shock. This is part of American popular culture. Uh, this one here was from the original Twilight Zone oh, yeah. series. <laughs> when Shatner is there, you can see the gremlin there. Mind you, he's on this plane. He's, no one saw the gremlin but him. And this woman is sleeping. And later on, he's really upset because like, no one notices it. Then when they made the first remake of Twilight Zone, it was done again. And then in the version of the Twilight Zone coming out right now, it's done again. And the question is, why would I do this? Well, think of Shatner as being a, a Russian specialist who's like looking out and sees the threat. Now, here's the threat, and here's pretty much everyone else who is just sort of ignoring it, not putting it together. And so what am I talking about? I'm talking about how to characterize and think of what the Russians did with respect to the Brexit referendum vote and the US presidential election. And how you characterize it is very, very important. And then you can think of it as intervention, interference, meddling, collusion, conspiracy, coordination. You know, the word you choose is very, very important. Some are broader than others, obviously. Uh, my presentation roadmap, I'll start off by going on context and scope, then I'll be dealing with what Russia did in the UK, then what Russia did in the United States, and then I'll do some other things, including discussing uh, Professor Jameson's model for countering weaponization of social media, which is at the University of Pennsylvania. The need for some candor. Uh, the very first point is critically important, which is you need to understand that the United States and other countries have been intervening in the Soviet Union's domestic relations ever since it was established. I mean, in 1917, the Brits and the French landed troops in Angles and Romansk. And so that the whole idea of being you know, surrounded and attacked is very, uh, very much a part of the psychology of the Soviets and the Russians. The other thing you need to understand is that the US media, with the passage of time during the Cold War, had a huge effect on the psychology of sort of the intelligentsia within the Soviet Union. And also, another very important thing to keep in mind, in 1996, the United States was instrumental in ensuring the re-election of Boris Yeltsin, including providing financing for his re-election campaign. Now, most Americans don't know this. And it's this, combined with some other things, which sort of motivates you know, Putin in terms of his own worldview. So when Americans have this holier-than-thou attitude about what was going on, you know, it's really not justified by reality. It's just a question of where the good guys and they're not. Uh, but the other thing which is important is the tools that are available now have produced unparalleled capability. And so it's like now these things are more likely to be effective. And that's what people are really complaining about. I mean, it's always been taking place. But now the potential for doing it in different ways is unbelievable. Uh, just to give you some idea about social media used for interference, you know, this is the Russian Soviet Union, the United States. Radio has been, you know, originally the most important thing. Uh, the print, the Russians have you know, wire services. And now the Russians have television, which, at least in the UK, is viewed as sort of being legitimate media as opposed to state run media. Uh, the United States recently. Uh, have established an online television station called Current, well, they call it Nasirashev Renya, 
the current TV. Uh, and that's actually a very interesting, uh, it's all in Russian, but it, it's getting a larger and larger audience given the fact that it's such a clampdown on independent media within Russia. And of course, there's BBC News, which has always had a Russian uh, language broadcast for like the past 20 years at least, but its news you know, tends to be less targeted <coughs> in terms of a political objective like BBC overall. But when thinking about Russia in terms of where it ranks, when you think of it in terms of the OECD data, in terms of the economy, you know, Russia is at the bottom of this list here, I think it's 11. Its GDP is lower than the state of California. And then you're sort of wondering, well, how is it able to basically punch so high above its weight? And part of it has to do with the fact that it's willing to do it, willing to be aggressive, to the ruling elite is able to adopt policies with very little regard to the consequences to their own citizens. You know, and not only their own citizens, but their own financial interests of the private sector. Obviously, the oligarchs control a large share of the economy and the dividing line between the ruling elite and the people that own the economy is often hard to identify. Uh, it's often useful to think about Russia not as being a traditional nation state like the Westphalian, Australian model, but think of it as being like the British East Indies Company, where it's owned by the ruling elite, and that its foreign policy is largely the further <coughs> the wealth of the ruling elite. The other thing which is kind of interesting, which I sort of tried to look at when I was in Australia, was the degree to which the Russians could manipulate markets to make money for the ruling elite. With respect to Australia, a lot of the exports that Australia has are similar to what Russia exports. And I was looking at, over time, the degree to which it was possible to identify the amount of Russian investment in the private sector in Australia, which of course you can't do because through shills and shams, it's, it's an impossible exercise. But Another thing which is also important is the absence of a common lexicon in describing you know, cyber operations. And, you know, and this absence of a common lexicon is not only between the public and private sector, it's between the political class and the military. The whole idea of people talking about cyber war, cyber warfare, war is a political phenomenon. It's when the, the people who run the government declare war. An act of war could be anything. You know, so that when there's a discussion about acts of war and things like that, it's really a non-discussion because the, the law of war, the international law governing cyber ops, is in a very well-developed, you know, sort of body of law in terms of the law of armed conflict. Uh, war, as I said, is a political idea and must be understood as such. And this also creates a difficulty when, let's say, Russia, the United States, and China are talking about trying to establish rules of the game, dealing with cyber operations. They can't even agree on common, operate, common vocabulary. This thing, actually, the Center on San Sanctions and Illicit Finance has a very good monograph, which is worth looking at. Just point that out there. But I think the most useful way to think of what the Russians have done is it's more equivalent to you know, basically espionage. And it's espionage, the first thing is you know, this is a category of information warfare and influence operations where one party is directing against an adversary. And you know, the information warfare is you know, very much a soft pa power concept, which is linked to other types of things which are going on and is taking place without kinetic violence. You know, the idea being that you want to be below the threshold that would trigger something 
and we'll get into that in a second. Uh, this you know, basic lab is discussing cyber operations. One thing I'm very happy about Professor Allenby's presentation is I'm often criticized that I have too much information on my slides. That, you know, people are like, <laughs> trying to read it and they stop. Well, don't, don't really read the slides that much, just listen to me. All the information which is important is there, you can look at it later. I'm not one of these lawyers who has like four bullet points on their slides and then people are thinking, well, what do you say about that? <laughs> Whatever. So anyway, and you can distinguish between two types of cyber operations. One, which is simply attacks on computer systems. Okay? <coughs> and since that triggers you know, a physical type thing, which could be similar to a kinetic impact, that could sort of trigger traditional war. Then you have cyber ops doing all different types of things, which are a different type of category, which are you know, being open source information, they're stealing information, uh, they're trying to get information about personnel, etc. And Scott Stewart has a good piece about that. Another important thing to keep in mind is whether aggressive cyber operations should be thought of within the rubric of law enforcement or, you know, basically military action actions. And here, we have two things. One is, for the United States and the UK, the, the principal agencies for cyber attacks against civilian targets. And you know, obviously the United States, the leads are Department of Justice in the UK, it's MI5 and MI6, MI6 does international. Then you have DHS, which has the programmatic responsibility. It's the home office in the UK that does this. Uh, and State Department, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then the military. And the primary natures of the response which correspond to those above are criminal penalties in DOJ principally, civil sanctions, uh, public diplomacy, and military actions. But to be effective, to be highly effective, a foreign state like Russia, or conceivably Iran, Iraq, and China, need a domestic enabler. You can only get so much information without being present in the country, and the domestic enabler could fall into different categories. One is there would be people who have a commonality of views. Second are people who have a commonality of interest in the idea that, let's say, uh, economic interests with a foreign country or things like that. Uh, let's say that you know, a Chinese company wants to do something which will be harmful to, a, to an economic competitor of an American company or things like that. You know, you may not know who you're dealing with in this world. Uh, then, of course, you know, there's more you know, typical ways of getting cooperation, like paying people for it. <laughs> but now we'll get into the Brexit world. On the eve of the Brexit vote, it was very, very close. But what's interesting, on the one hand, while the numbers sort of suggested it was a toss-up, when people had to put their money on the table, most people thought that Remain was going to win. Now, if you look here, you see the dates and who was doing it. The leave responses to these polls, and of course don't trust polls because there, there are many, many reasons that people are not necessarily honest with people, the pollsters and things like that. Very often there are different you know, techniques which are used which are problematic. Anyway, you see 52% for leave, 50%, then for the remain, 45, 48, 46, 48. So basically it's a toss up because within, you see the the undecideds and the amount of the leads, but basically it was a statistical tie for most of these things. And here are some notes in terms of like where these numbers came from and why you can't really believe it. Like for example, the economists, they had they looked at it was a poll of polls, mm -hmm. and they had fewer than 900 participants. Mm -hmm. But to understand 
really how difficult it was to characterize the significance of the Brexit vote. <coughs> the actual vote was you know, 51 plus, nearly 52% versus 48%. And that was a voted turnout of 72%. So you think, oh, that's really good. Well, it's not really good. Because if the remaining people basically think that the status quo is good and that everyone really doesn't want to change things, not voting is 27%. It's a huge number. Then that yields, in terms of the number of people, the percentage of people supporting the status quo was 62.55%. Clearly, that leave people or a minority and there's another reason why this is very, very important. I'll talk about this a little bit later. But there are two categories of people who were not included in the referendum. The first are Brits who are living overseas, like in the EU. The second were university students. And now, if they're not attending a university where they you know, grew up and whatnot, they're very unlikely to have registered to vote in the locale where their school is located. It's not so easy in the UK. And so consequently, the voters who are probably most likely to have voted or remain were not included in that total. And when David Cameron came up with the idea of doing this vote in order to just put in the past the whole idea of leaving the EU, he didn't think about it in terms of how the rules he was establishing was going to affect the outcome. I mean, he just thought, well, of course, everyone's going to say remain, and we'll get it over. So, but think of it as amending a constitution with 50% plus one vote. It's not like, there are very few countries which will not require a supermajority to do things as important as amending a constitution. And so, this whole problem could have been avoided if someone had said to David Cameron, you know what, we're really rolling the dice on something which we need to think more about. And Remain was really, really overconfident in the entire process. As I said before, E membership represented the status quo. The, it had the support, the Remain, the Remain people had the broadest support of basically the economic elite within the UK, the, the major political parties' leadership and the most senior people were largely Remain people. Uh, and while both sides conducted, you know, targeting campaigns and things like that, we'll get into this in a while, the fact is that Leave's only advantage is that they had a much better targeting campaign, whereas the targeting campaign conducted by Remain was a lot less sophisticated. So let me just go a little bit about the hot button issues. Now, it will look very familiar to people who have followed what the voting was like in the United States when Trump, Mr. Trump won. You know, the idea that the older socially conservative vote, voters in economically marginal communities, i.e. the working, the working lower middle class, were the key to the outcome. It's sort of generally true. But once again, with generalizations, they're generally true, except when they're not. For example, in London, if you go into neighborhoods which are largely populated by Pakistanis and you know, people from the Caribbean and things like that, you usually think, well, they'll vote remain. Well, no, they don't vote remain. They don't want more people coming to the UK who might take their potential jobs. Just like in the United States, on one hand, you would think, well, the Latinos are going to want to have liberal immigration policies. No, they're not necessarily. Well, maybe it might be a 50-50 situation because they're thinking, you know, we came in legally, we waited, we did all these things. We don't want to have to compete with new Guatemalans and Hondurans for our jobs. And so that the whole idea of making generalizations about how these groups will think is always very dangerous. But the issues which the Leave people were hitting on is that the EU threatens British sovereignty, the, the regulations are bad for business, uh, that the EU favors the multinational corporations, there'll be too many immigrants coming in, there's more 
I mean, more people from Poland, all these other people that we really just don't need. Uh, that we need also to have a more rational immigration system like Canada has, which is a more of a skill-based system than what we have basically litigating anybody because we're the EU. So what happens in terms of the vote? The vote is the Brexit people got most of England and Wales, but not the cities. You know, Liverpool, Manchester, London, and Remain also got Northern Ireland and Scotland. A little bit on the demographics. Not surprisingly, the Remain people did best with the younger voters. But if the younger voters were at university, mind you not, the percentage of people going to university in the UK is less than in the United States, 73%. Uh, and then you just go down, it's, it's a direct line, 73, 62, 52, 44, 43, 40 for Remain. But the people at the bottom, the people at the top, the younger people, are going to be more affected in their lives that these people will be dying off. And so the people who have most at stake in the outcome were most in favor of Remain. Part of it also is they grew up with the idea that they could just pick up and go to the EU and get a job, or they could just bring over their spouse or their girlfriend or whatever, or their boyfriend, you know, it was just part of their mindset. Whereas these people might have not been thinking in that way. Were you still surprised at that 27% for the 18 to 24 year olds? Which is still relatively high, given they grew up with that mentality? Is it because their parents told them it's a bad idea? What, what, why was it mm. that, that much to leave? Well, well once, once again, it's you know, everything's sui generis, but they might be competing for jobs with, with people coming over. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the fact is they're, and not only people from within the EU, but also you know, people who are you know, seeking asylum coming up through Italy and other places, and they just don't want these people here. You know, it's like, all you gotta do is ride a tube after 10 o'clock and see these people you don't really want to have over your house, and you know, you see that it's a large number of them. I couldn't tell you the percentage, but I used to say I always was more concerned about riding the tube after 10 o'clock than I was riding the metro after 10 o'clock in France. Um, anyway, what was being done online, uh, this is you know, this sort of typical things where they, they make the initial contacts and you know, try to see this, the pool of people that they, they could rely on. Initially, there was being done by phone, being done by email, but by far the lead people had a more well-planned operation on this. And the other thing which is, and I'll get back to this later, Leave EU had the most sophisticated operation in terms of the online campaign. But they were not the official Leave campaign. I'll get into that in a second. And then Nigel Farage also played, you know, not an insignificant role. He has the United Kingdom Independent Party, and I'll get back to why he may be important in thinking about this in a second. Uh, advertisements. Advertisements matter. Not because they're really going to sway that many people, but you remember them. And I'm going to just point out a few of them. This one here has a Muslim woman seemingly indifferent as she walks past someone who was hurt. I, mean, I don't know how he's hurt. Uh, this is a, a slogan which you've heard a lot about, which is, we send the EU 350 million pounds a week. Let's keep the money at home. Uh, then this is like a little chart showing all the people being granted visa-free travel by the EU for Turkey. 76 million people, which of course is larger than the UK population. And the Remain people, and this is like serious, the, their, their advertisements looked kind of tepid. <coughs> Mind you, I originally thought, and I'll 
show you a little bit later that the Clinton things were like that. It was not the case in terms of the ads. And actually, I sent Katina yesterday. I was looking at uh, various uh, commercials on television, yes. you know, historically. Now. We'll share that for anyone because I thought that the Clinton ads were terrible, but actually, it was, the Clinton ads for her, for her were not very good, but her anti Trump ones were excellent. So I've embedded those at the end of the web page, all of those YouTube links that you sent. Great. Money. Money matters always. But in the UK, money doesn't matter. The, the available money is almost none. If you look at <coughs> the amount of money spent on something as important <coughs> as EU membership, this is laughable. And, be, and why it's laughable, I'll show you in a little while. But just think of what the population is of the UK. It's like 58 million people. So it's uh, 33 pence per person. Yeah. I'm sorry, could you go back one? Uh, So in, in, in this, um, what, what are the numbers that are not, because this, this is a tabulated list of spending, uh, what's not shown in this table that, that leads to the discrepancy in the... Uh... Okay, well, I'll, sh I'll be showing that later. But, because what happened is, uh, it's, it's probably Russian money. I see. Anyway, uh, this is one of the things which is, it's a guy named Aaron Banks, who loaned, mind you, it's sort of like Donald Trump loaning to his own campaign. Aaron Banks loaned 8.4 million pounds to the Leave campaign. And he's never been able to explain exactly where that money has come from, and that's been asked by members of parliament. Uh, he's had various connections with the Russians. He's been at meetings at their embassy. He was given uh, some preferential uh, deals, apparently. So the assumption by most people is his money is Russian money. And once again, as I said, he loaned the money. He didn't give it. Uh, he also, Nigel Farage, in terms of coordinating possibly with the Internet Research Agency, uh, passed information to Julian Assange, apparently. Want to believe that Farage actually now denies it, but if you look on YouTube, you'll see various times of views on television where he's like not consistent in terms of what he says. Uh, with last thing I just want to point out, the Electoral Commission in the UK, you know, is allegedly investigating where banks' money came from. Starting really the investigation in November of last year. These three names are names worth keeping in mind. Alexander Nix was the former head of Cambridge Analytica. Uh, as you know, Cambridge Analytica is no more. Uh, he's someone who, on the one hand, has said that Cambridge Analytica played an important role in the Brexit vote and then later denied it. <laughs> and so mm -hmm. Alexander Kogan is an American citizen who has his PhD uh, from UCAL, UCAL Berkeley. Uh, he's also given lectures at University of St. Petersburg. He's denied <coughs> uh, doing work for the Russians, but he's admitted uh, doing work on micro-targeting and having some type of uh, informal relationships with Russian academics, who of course 99% of Russian academics work for the state. And then Christopher Wiley, uh, you might have seen him on Frontline. Uh, he's like the whistleblower on the Facebook Cambridge Analytica da data scandal, uh, the full, all the facts of which remain to be seen, both with respect to the United States and the UK. He's a Canadian. Anyway, this is basically the whole idea of 
you know, some of the theories behind this, uh, the idea people remember, people have a very short attention span for ads, negative things have greater impact. Uh, sort of the retail market, you know, this is their, the Daily Express sort of serves the function of the National Enquirer in the UK, and you know, their front page stories were all sort of you know, anti-immigrant uh, type things. Uh, Sky News, which is sort of the low-brow uh, television network in the UK, set satellite, it was owned by Rupert Murdoch, who of course was not only a pro-leave person, but also someone who is pro-Trump. There's a really interesting long article in The New Yorker uh, last month about Rupert Murdoch, the people so inclined. I would read that article because it's astounding the impact this Australian has had both in the United States and the UK on political developments. It's really frightening. Internet research agency may know about it. Uh, you know, it has a fairly sophisticated operation in terms of, you know, it has four departments, data analysis, graphics, information technology, and search engine optimization, sort of describes the different things that it did for various, uh, actually with respect to the Trump campaign and, and leave. What's really kind of interesting, if you could find it, I, I haven't been able to locate it, on the PBS NewsHour, a former employee of IRA was being interviewed where he, after he had quit because he was bothered by what was being done there. And I sort of wonder, uh, after, you know, a month or two after that interview was given what happened to him professionally. I mean, it was astounding for me to hear him explain what was essentially, you know, KGB or state-sponsored influence campaign against the United States to reveal that. I mean, basically, it's disclosing classified information to you know, PBS. Breaks of things. Uh, the most, once again, you look at this later, but the most important thing about this is while overall the, uh, the messaging probably did not play a large ro role, in the last several days, there was a huge barrage of social media, which could have been instrumental in terms of getting at the vote. These are just some of the, uh, the tweets, once again, some familiar type of things, anti-Islamic, uh, immigration issues, you know, et cetera. You see the number of retweets, and the topics are all. Islamic, other, and yes. Did you find that um, the hashtags that they were using, were, did the agency itself generate most of them, or did they glom onto ones that were existing and made them more, um, uh, they proliferated them? They proliferated. Okay. So that they even uh, brought on Bahrain servers to drown out hashtags. Mm -hmm. To uh, drown out hashtags. Yeah, so you, you get an existing hashtag, and let's just say it's hashtag Syria, and you drown it out with whatever message you want, yeah. which means the real messages, which are human-driven, mm -hmm. are drowned out by the bot-driven messages. So I think with uh, Hillary, was it 1% of the bots generated 19 million tweets? Mm -hmm. But you think it's a, a person, but it's a fake identity, yeah. etc. Okay, Russian objection, objectives. And this gets back to uh, Professor Allenby's type thing in terms of how international conflict is being <coughs> done today and why, which is Great Britain is the biggest supporter of sanctions against Russia for Russia's annexation of Crimea and, and invasion occupation of eastern Ukraine. Uh, you know, the economic sanctions against Russia, while not quite as well, not as effective as the sanctions against Iran, certainly, is causing a lot of pain for a lot of people. And the elimination <coughs> of economic sanctions was probably the principal 
objective of the Russian uh, social media campaign in the United States, the lifting of sanctions. Uh, also, you know, the idea that limiting the U.S. influence in things like NATO, the IMF, the World Bank, World Trade Organization, also weakens the UK. And so that was also a key objective there. Let's see. <coughs> this is just, it's interesting, uh, once again, in the House of Commons, they're discussing these issues, nothing's happened. And Theresa May has not taken up this issue. Partially, just like uh, Mr. Trump doesn't like discussions about Russian interference in the US presidential election. Theresa May, who originally opposed Brexit, is afraid to undermine the legitimacy of the Brexit vote. I've never quite understood that. And you know, all the things that have happened. This guy, uh, Matt Hancock, you know, has sort of rang the alarm bells in terms of Russian interference, and you all know about the fact that the House of Commons can't seem to get their act together. You know, the UK, without Northern Ireland and Scotland, is not so great. Now, <coughs> part two. Now, this map is probably not necessary for you. When I give this talk to a foreign audience, it is, because essentially, Going into the election, it was looked like there was a simple path to victory, which was that Clinton had to win every state that Obama won, but for, say, Florida, not necessarily, and not necessarily Michigan. But the path to victory seemed to be relatively straightforward and did not produce any great anxiety really until the final weeks when the, inter when the state polling data started coming back from Wisconsin and things like that. And you remember that Obama was on the campaign trail and there was a reallocation of you know, resources by the Clinton campaign. So, yeah. Now, what the Russians did, and you, you know this from reading the Mueller report. Oh, I should say one more thing, which is, I have not, I've been giving this report for the past six months, different audiences sort of updating it. I have not had to update the part dealing with Russia based on the Mueller report and based on things which I've been reading in the Washington Post and things like that. So that all the discussion which I have here has been out there in the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal before. And so I was very happy to, you know, when I saw that, this, so that when you hear people sort of disingenuously saying, oh, there was no significant interference, and whatever, it's just nonsense. But in understanding, remember the, the Hollywood tapes and then certainly thereafter, the, the hacking, the release of, uh, of the emails, the, the information, uh, this just goes through things which are in the report, I want to get into this, but you have basically the GRU, GRU which is the Russian Military Intelligence Unit, you know, doing the hacks, acquiring the information, and passing it on to WikiLeaks, which is then released. So that was sort of the operation. So it was more, the email stuff was more, operation was more complex than what, what IRA had to do with respect to the UK, because there was no obtaining confidential information, because the information was already out there. So it was a question of getting and repeating information from other pro-Brexit organizations, just repeating it and you know maybe trying to target it a little bit better. But with, the information was already out in the information marketplace. And once again, this goes discusses various things in terms of the Twitter, uh, fees, the advertisements and things like that. One thing which is also really important and different for 
the UK situation, the US situation, is the micro-targeting of African-American voters and Sanders supporters. You know, with, with Brexit, it was an either or. Either you're for Brexit or against you, you stay home. In the United States, the added wrinkle was, okay, you may not like Hillary Clinton, but we can't to make sure that you don't vote for her. So that they were targeting African-American voters who might have voted for Hillary Clinton for some reason, trying to get, her, get them to stay home. And Jill Stein, Jill Stein's votes in Florida would have had it been, had those people voted in favor of Hillary Clinton, she would have won Florida, just like Al Gore was screwed over by Ralph Nader. Uh, I think also in Michigan, Jill Stein was the difference for Hillary Clinton as well. And so that Jill Stein had gone to Moscow, you've probably seen her like sitting at a table with Vladimir Putin. Uh, she is like one of their favorite third party candidates. Uh, and so you have to ask yourself, why are they cultivating that relationship? And in the investigations by uh, the special prosecutor, Jill Stein, has been not so forthcoming with information and sort of resenting having to do anything. Whether or not whether she's simply a fellow traveler or whether she's, you know, on their payroll or whatever it means to be seen. Uh, important factors, why this is possible. You know, obviously, the traditional media is in decline in the United States. You know, when you were younger, you know, CBS, ABC, and NBC, you know, they're basically a collective, you know, collective of what was considered to be the, the base minimum of information that Americans have to have, the three networks that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, the idea that this weaker, po po weaker party affiliation, uh, independents are up. But perhaps the most important thing is the last minute decisions about who to vote for. Uh, Wisconsin, 14% of the people decided the last week. Pennsylvania, 17%. Michigan, 11%. So that if you're in the Clinton campaign trying to decide what to do, and they see these numbers, you know, people who have not said who they're for, they're thinking, well, this person may not vote. So that the need to do something was not so readily apparent. This is a guy who I'm going to be very interested in following over you know, the coming months, Fred Corsale who has played down the role of Cambridge Analytica in the US election, says that really did nothing. Uh, he has gone from being the digital manager, digital director for Trump in the 2016 campaign to be the, being the campaign manager for Trump, okay? You, Trump has been running for president almost within a week of being elected. And they're generating all this money. And you have to ask yourself, are they buying the loyalty and the silence of people like Greg Parscale? And once again, if you look at Frontline, and he's been interviewed at various things, uh, he's less, seems less than candid. You catch him in all these different statements. But the degree to which Facebook was willing to work with him, Facebook did not have like a manual for doing like social media campaigns, things like that. So Parscale invited Facebook to send people down to him in Austin so that they would help him do his campaign. You know, once again, that came out you know, after the election. Once again, Frontline has some good material on that. So that Facebook, while politically, you might think it's of a particular ilk, in terms of what it did, in terms of its operations, produces a different outcome. Well, I understand they, Facebook offered their services also to the Clinton campaign. I, well, I don't think it was taken. I don't know how it was done. You know, but, of 
more scholarly might have simply been more sophisticated about this. We shouldn't forget that Obama was known as a social media president as well. Yeah. There was a history there of presidents utilizing social media platforms to reach people. So, so on both sides, I, I think that there was some. Yeah. But you're right, I, I didn't see. They just went with the same style of campaign that Obama had yeah. on social media, yeah, not the, different. The, the level of micro-targeting yeah, that's was, right. was not as important. But also, what drove it was the polling people for Trump identified that the battleground states were indeed in play. Whereas for the Clinton campaign, really the only two states that they were concerned about were Florida and North Carolina. Mm -hmm. I mean, essentially they thought everything else was just going to be a repeat yes. you know, of you know, Obama's victory. So, this is just apropos of nothing. It shows the ties between Trump and Cambridge Analytica uh, which, and, and you see at the top, John Bolton, you see Steve Bannon, Jared uh, you know, Kushner, Kellyanne Conway, etc. cetera. Uh, we'll, we may learn more about this as time goes on. And I just want to bring that to your attention and without saying any more, because I'm going to get sued. <laughs> uh, there are two indictments. Whenever you, know, you hear Mr. Trump say fake news, this is all nonsense, witch hunt. Well, there are two indictments, and since we obviously don't have access to what Mr. Mueller has, or we also don't have access to what the Russians have assembled, we'll never know the full extent. But Mr. Mueller will be obviously fairly conservative in putting together an indictment <coughs> because so much rides on this. Back when they came out with the first report on Russian interference in the US elections, the report that was generated had technical problems, or at least the people that, that challenged uh, some of the analysis. It looked bad to the United States, and sort of good for the Trumpian view. Uh, these are much better. IRA ads, you know, the We'll remember this one in the top right mm -hmm. being used. The thing about the IRA is they didn't care about whether the ads were in bad taste or offensive or explosive, whatever. You know, Trump, in essence, allowed IRA you know, to take the lead as being as outlandish as possible. While there are other organizations in the United States that might have been willing to run some of these ads, uh, you don't know who they are. You know, these are ones which are sort of beyond the pale. This one got even the, Fra the Pope Francis endorsement thing was even mentioned on PBS as likely being a fake thing that's covered. But you know, these ads had sort of ripple effect because they'd be put up on social media and then they'd be discussed by social media. Do you know what's interesting? That question at the back. Oh, yeah. I was just curious if you could speak a little bit about sort of mining and finding these things, like them being images as opposed to combinations of images and like searchable text. Does that make sense? Yeah. <coughs> I, I can't speak to the technical side of it. I just wonder if you have any comments about it. So, so colors, uh, and people chime in if they, you see here, you might have experience. Yeah, um, so, uh, I'm working on a couple projects that mm -hmm. that uses similar technology, not too political. Mm -hmm. One is on food waste. Actually, we're 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 collecting. This is for uh, the European Union, and we're doing the, the research in South America. Mm -hmm. That we're actually collecting pictures uh, that we're able to, with training neural networks, to actually know how much food's being wasted. Mm -hmm. So you can do exactly the same thing. And we're doing another one for a, a e-commerce platform. That, that they have third-party sellers, they were identifying attributes of the picture and how that picture influences uh, click-through and sales. The same technology that you can use to basically get a neural network to train to see attributes of images, you can do to this, and then you can link to text, and then you can see click-throughs, and then you can do a whole lot of other things. The only trick is, um, is understanding how that, that image 
um, has a certain types of attributes. For example, we can look at Hillary's face and say the one on the corner there, you, uh, an AI system can easily identify rage. Right? You can see the Trump picture with the, with the um, uh, Pope Francis there, right? And you can see completely, so an AI can easily associate that and then you can do a segment analysis. It's pretty fun. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so so the, it, what it can be powerful is that that, that level of um, um, insight in terms of not only of textual image, but also contextual mm -hmm. and then um, um, images per se can be all linked in, so the, 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 the level of um, um, understanding that you can, can provide of all those things in, in the same way you can manipulate it, um, it's extremely powerful. Sorry, uh, no, I'll try to. I can refer to you. Colors, right? Colors are important. Yeah. So dark colors versus light colors. Absolutely. Like, look at that. Halo, right? Yeah. Uh, and as uh, Eusebio said, and then we get even, you know, rubbish. It's, yeah. it, it's implicit in the image. But, um, you can even do that with video. We're getting better at that. Yeah. How do we, for example, um, how do we uh, identify, for example, pedophilia online or child mm -hmm. pornography online? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you do that? With the same kinds of uh, processes that we've been describing. But interestingly here um, as well, it's almost exactly perhaps his mechanism, look, the average Democrat voter is just plain stupid, the reason to manipulate. They've actually told us that the reason to manipulate. We're, we're saying that it's such, it's such a subtle thing, but they're telling us, we think you guys are stupid, you know, uh, just plain stupid. So the attack is telling us their attack mechanism, but we interpret it in a way that, that, that mustn't be me because I'm not stupid. And so I wanted to ask Braden in the last presentation, if it's so subtle we're not aware of it, prove it, right? Mm -hmm. And this is what I'm always asked by reporters, you know, you're saying A, B, or C, prove it. And this is the thing that necessarily even the people who are building the AI programs can't prove it because the AI is taking on its own <coughs> path in learning, right? It's, it's learning through its data set. But if we were to compile the data sets, it would be a wonderful exercise. Um, and of course, you know, the Trump ads, and also some of the social media ads, the idea of making Trump look presidential. You know, so the, the upper right hand. Just to build on, if you look at those pictures, it, um, an AI system can easily identify, for example, American flag. Uh, the other thing it can do can identify gender, can identify race can do a lot of things that, that will be able just with that picture to look. And then try to understand how the attributes, for example, the more American flags are on the background, does it produce mm -hmm. less or more mm -hmm. uh, certain types of sediment? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you can know the stuff. So the difference between before marketeers were guessing the stuff, mm -hmm. now you can know with the level of precision that is just mind blowing. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of like Clockwork Orange, with the guys Mm -hmm. All the images, and then also the parallax view, another movie which mm -hmm. the same type of thing. Which, once again, showing the animization of the media, Fox being the most important outlet for Mr. Trump. But this is really interesting. There's many, many uh, local news outlets which are owned by, I just went blank on the name of the company. It's owned by one company. Do you remember what it is? What? It's Sinclair. 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 Sinclair Bro Broadcasting owns, and, they, and their network affiliations, typically Fox, owns all these stations in relatively small markets, and they, and Sinclair Company dictates what the local you know, hosts <coughs> have to say. And uh, once again, on PBS News Now, which is like my source of news, uh, and Frontline, they basically showed, like one after another, these people say exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. so, so that it all sort of works together as an organized you know, propaganda thing. Oxford Internet Institute is, does a lot of good work in the area of internet research. And it was looking after 
you know, the 2016 election. Mind you, Oxford Internet Institute rejected the idea that the IRA had an impact on the election, mm -hmm. on its disclosure. But what they're doing right now is they're trying to rile up like right-wing people in the United States. They're trying to encourage alienation of African Americans and you know, increasing the idea of identity politics by largely Hispanics and aggregating the tension within the United States between uh, you know, Latinos and African Americans. The idea being that their interests are very different. Uh, one of the hot button issues is reparations. You know, the, the, nothing offends a Latino more, uh, well, it's a not correct thing to say, but apparently Latino voters were annoyed when African Americans raised the issue of reparations because they think their lives have been hard to coming to the states. The idea of developing a mechanism for reparations, assuming that he even wanted to do that, would be really hard given you know, you know, all these different factors over time. If you, and you know, as I said, there's a special commission which is being discussed to try to address this, and it's a very controversial, complex thing. Uh, just very quickly, uh, Professor Jameson's work. She basically identifies like, the different phases that has to be done by uh, the social media campaign planner, where first you try to identify you know, the, the, prime, the issues to be primed. Then you try to help the viewer or the recipient of the me message, uh, how you should be thinking about that issue. Then it's further development in terms of framing the issue, not merely how you should develop it, but really what should be done. Then the whole idea of contagion and interpersonal networks, the idea of sharing, and then some other factors such as you know, dealing with short attention span and other things like that. There's a difference in opinion. I mean, Nate Silver you know, basically predicted uh, Trump's victory and has done a really good job you know, projecting on elections, sort of discounted the role of social media um, on Trump's victory. Uh, there's two MIT guys who think that it holds promise and believe that you could show, show that it was decisive in achieving Mr. Trump's victory. Uh, this just compares you know, the UK and the US situation in terms of what was done. The ideas advanced by Professor Jameson, you, know, you read them, and they seem rather superficial. Like everything that she proposes could be circumvented. And you know, it's the idea that any rule or regulation which you can write down so we could plan around it. You know, be it you know, financial threshold. And one of the things that she said, which at first glance would be a good idea, is that any political ad that comes out has to list or have a link to every prior political ad. But the thing is in the United States, you know, with First Amendment rights and with the ability to create accounts and things like that, it's just not feasible what she wants to do in terms of the consequences and accountability. And the other thing is getting back to Russia. Russia could find people in the United States who are willing to say exactly what they feel. So that the reason why in 2016 they did what they did was they had to do it outside the country. Now, they don't have to do that outside the country. They could find people inside the country who are willing to do their thing. So that the past model you know, is of limited value. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> oh, let me just add, I, I gave, I was doing some study on my own yesterday looking at uh, campaign ads. 
And so I sent to Katina yesterday you know, several different things. Because what triggered it was I was looking at uh, Clinton's ads, which were considered by many to be anemic. And she, one of her failures as a candidate was to articulate a reason for her candidacy. Uh, and so I was looking at her ads, and some of her anti-Trump ads were quite good, I thought. The ones pushing herself were not so good. But anyway, I have a bunch of them, everything from 65 years of attack ads, where what was an attack ad in those days would not be considered a silly attack ad today. Uh, the most effective ads, in which I think the one most effective ad you'll see is uh, Lyndon Johnson's ad, the little girl with a daisy. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very global order. The best ads of 2016, and I guess that's it. And then fake news, which is probably worth saying, which is at most conferences, people are absolutely terrified of what the consequences will be of fake news. Because that science, and mind you, I'm, I'm just like looking at some examples of it, of trying to uh, make it appear like candidates or public figures are saying certain things is advancing. And so if you watch, for example, on Mr. Robot, they have you know, you know, things, cuts in where it looks like you know, President Obama is speaking about what's taking place in the show. Uh, you know, the possibility that these things will cause damage or be picked up on, and that the consequences of the ads are reported is you know, fairly high. Uh, the use of social media to get people uh, riled up in, in terms of international conflict within countries is huge. Uh, there was a situation, I, don't, I think it was about six months ago, where there was a fake, fake news story. Mind you, this is made more possible through the internet. But of course, it probably happened when you rely on print media, where allegedly some Israeli official was like threatening Pakistan with like, nuclear destruction or something. Because historically, Israel has always had a close relationship with India, even though they don't want to advertise it too much. And so at a point of Indian and Pakistani you know, tension, some Israeli official allegedly said something, and the Pakistanis reacted like, we too have nuclear weapons. It was this big crisis, and they had to sort of unwalk all back because it didn't take place. The same thing with the Rohingyas you know, in Myanmar. But if you think of what the consequences were in Rwanda, it was simply radio. And then you think, well, imagine if it were visual, where they would take things and spread it. Mm -hmm. It's really quite frightening. Thank you so much, Ethan. Um, we've asked a few questions of you so far. I know there will be more over lunch. But just to be respectful to the panel that's gone live on WebEx about 30 minutes ago, uh, we will go, Derek, if we can, to the WebEx. Uh, and just to say on that last point, uh, and a point I've made in one of my articles, is if we could visualize these social media tweets floating from planes as they did in World War II with Nazi propaganda, if you could just see them coming down quantifiably, mm -hmm. and then in motion, Mm -hmm. And I remember when I made that claim in a conversation piece, uh, someone took great offense to that, that I was comparing today's conflicts with World War II uh, and what happened during that time. But I think I go back to Braden as well, who says the old tactics are just being renewed in an incredibly powerful online platform, mm -hmm. which has n many times magnified manifold and in a magnified way the same outcome but at the back a comment while we're setting up yeah, yeah. just a quick comment so um i know i came in late um but the you know, bit that i saw of your talk and other talks that talk about the implications of social media really focuses on twitter which i think is interesting because there is an entire other spectrum you know, particularly like Instagram, you know, Snapchat yes. and other platforms that much younger people are on yes. that do not, you know, that don't even do Twitter anymore because that's kind of, you know, so I think there's an even more expansive conversation that may not be happening quite yet because it is such a task to sort of 
bring all of that together and make some conclusive statement about any of this. I just, just want to add one more thing, uh, which relates a little bit to that. One of the reasons that the Russians were able to sort of get their head around this whole issue is that during Soviet times, the average citizen didn't believe anything they read, didn't believe anything on television. Mm -hmm. And so that was the mindset largely. And so the only people they trusted were their friends. Mm -hmm. And so that's why something like Instagram or Twitter or whatever, mm -hmm. it would resonate, which is, I just got this from mm -hmm. Ivan or mm -hmm. Sasha or Natalia. And mm -hmm. so that they would think, someone, someone took the time to send me that. Mm -hmm then I should look at it, whereas they would just ignore everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do people want to talk about the different platforms for a moment while Derek's setting up? Uh, yeah, I, actually that's a question that I have too, is um, coming from international development, different cultures rely on different platforms. For example, mm -hmm. in India, mm -hmm. uh, it's very much WhatsApp, and mm -hmm. news that's spread around on WhatsApp and becomes very uh, opaque, because unlike Twitter, you can't see what's, what's happening. And, and, and this, the implications of of, of rumors spreading on, on, on WhatsApp uh, and, and, and uh, happening in, in the decision process faster than um, uh, you know, news can go around and, and, and all that. Um, but I, I guess the question I have is, is specifically about um, the, the different platforms that you, you've studied uh, culturally and, and, and the impact of that. and. Uh, I've just looked at these two. Just as Facebook. These two, these two case, case studies. Yeah. I should also mention, I read yesterday in the FT that um, FT is, sorry, uh, Facebook is giving over to the Social Science Research Council control over their data, which is being given to 30 research institutions, which are going to be looking at the impact of social media and sort of influencing political processes. I don't know which 30 research institutions have been so designated, but we'll be seeing more about this. But one of the things which was significant was the cutoff date for the data is January 1, 2017. That is after mm. the <laughs> two elections, the two voting things which I've discussed. Mm -hmm. And then of course the question will be why. Uh, <laughs> But that will be something worth following. And actually, if anyone knows who those organizations are, I would love to, to mm -hmm. find out. I would guess the Grand Corporation would get one of them because they have a lot of people who are looking at social media. But so Facebook, Twitter are very well studied because there are uh, statistical tools to actually analyze uh, Twitter, Twitter messaging and, and hashtags mm. are already freely available on the internet, maybe even six years ago. Yeah. Uh, Tweetsphere and Tweetstats and all of these other geographic based uh, Twitter sort of apps. And uh, then you have the Facebook, which was well analyzed. Uh, interestingly, I think we could look at as well the idea of the tribes, or tribalism or clans. Mm. And we mentioned Somalia in the first and second talk briefly. Uh, but uh, WhatsApp uh, has just gone private, hasn't it? Did we hear that? Facebook yeah. has always been. Facebook has it and yes. Instagram. Uh, <laughs> and Instagram, yeah. Right. right. So uh, what is happening on there, and Snapchat in a different way, because it's mm. a short, bursty messaging, but it's to groups. Um, mm -hmm. I was just curious if the IRA has been targeting 4chan or 8chan at all, and even like less moderated to put out even more extreme messages. I sh there's, there was a, University of Oxford did a graphical study about uh, six months ago or so, looking at, uh, uh, I think it was Russian influence on different uh, social media platforms and uh, in, in different countries. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the part of the study did mention that even on um, Tinder, uh, there was operations of trying to Change mm. people's yeah. opinions. Mm. Yeah, they're doing uh, pl I mean, for political, you know, mm. to oh, vote for this candidate or this way of, of mm. putting bots, on, you know, uh, bots into different platforms. They're, they're probably doing every possible thing that they could think of. Mm. So they're also doing it throughout the. I mean, they're doing oh, yeah. it right, right, yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, 
One of the things that oh. just try to, to, to help answer the question on, on different platforms. One of the things I, I, I because of the work that I do in different parts of the world, for example, if you look at WhatsApp, India, South America, uh, parts of Africa, hardly used. But also, what is interesting, the type of channel we use to communicate. Um, if you look at let's, some of the stuff we're doing in Brazil, depending on the social extract that you're looking, you will see more written word versus actually voice. Mm, so yes. instead of writing, people are actually mm -hmm. sending voice messages. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is, we're trying to correlate that to levels of instruction. And, but what is interesting is that voice is very easy to, to codify and then uh, becomes it's some sort of searchable. One of the, 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 really the challenge now is video and, um, um, and, 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 and emotions. Mm -hmm. But um, it's just a matter of time, uh, how accurate they become. So it's, it's very interesting that you see different places with different media, and then the different channels that are used within the platforms mm -hmm. with the type of communication, and you, you can associate groups and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you so much. We're going to go straight into this. There's about 20 minutes left of this audio. We've got Alan Whitfield, Sarah Speakerman speaking now. So Louise oh, Dennis and two others. Uh, we'll just go in. And, this was um, a special so issue. In a nutshell, um, they have, um, have extensive reasoning why values are not accessible for machines. And as a result, machines simply don't have the data input they need to really make as a Yeah. So we do have another question that uh, deals with the actual uh, integration of ethics. Um, so uh, as a machine learning engineer, someone who's a machine learning engineer is asking this question, we deal mostly with models and algorithms. Uh, how do we integrate ethics into the machine learning model? And I think that's an interesting question that ties back to uh, the design and implementation aspect. So would, uh, would any of you like to take that for now? Um, I'd be happy to start off with that, and then perhaps uh, Louise might, uh, might right. be able to uh, weigh in. Um, yes, the, in fact, we make the distinction in the special issue between um, implicitly ethical machines and explicitly ethical machines. So, um, uh, implicitly ethical machines are machines that are simply designed to avoid an ethical outcome. 